and we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Toe the Lines BKB 22 post-fight reflections with me, George Glinski, joined as always by my partner in crime, Paolo Lucci. Paolo, how are we doing? Good, mate. Just about recovered from uh, the weekend at BKB 22. Been a great week. Yeah, a mental week. Obviously, people will have seen the chilly challenge with me and Dan Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> it was a was a pretty pretty vicious week. Some water for, me. for you, mate. <laughs> yeah, pretty vicious weekend for me. But yeah, three days ago it was now. So we've gathered our thoughts and we're ready to give our reflections and and our thoughts on all the performances and all the crazy moments from the night. So here we go. The first fight of the night was between Danny Deval and Stephen Evans at super middleweight. Once again, Paolo, another great Welsh fighter. Stephen Evans looked really impressive. Comes from a very credentialed Welsh international amateur boxing background. And he showed that. It just seemed as though it was the, the cleaner work from Stephen Evans which won him the fight. It was a first round TKO in 50 seconds. But yeah, Danny Devell, he's he's a really nice guy. Um, very marketable, I have to say. Very, very marketable. Um, just needs a few things polishing up. He was reaching a lot with that with that lead hand and and leading with the right hand, not not working the jab the way you would have liked to uh, to fake that that backhand in. But yeah, just just a few things that need polishing up there that Stephen Evans had on him. More of a technical difference that that made that fight what it was. But yeah, Stephen, he looks looks really impressive and and really nice to get another classy boxer at those those higher weight classes. In fact, speaking of Welsh high-end Welsh guys. He reminded me a little bit of Barry Jones, just like a hard-hitting, very precise hitting southpaw. Mm. He seemed really controlled and composed and definitely got a good future if he carries on. Obviously, we need to see a bit more of him. You know, you can't jump to any conclusions after 50 or so seconds in the ring. Mm. But yeah, from what we did see, he looks good. Nice and precise hitting. Some good right hands, sorry, left hands. Mm. But yeah, backhand from a southpaw, obviously. And um, I do, yeah, do agree. Deval didn't really seem to throw a jab, to be honest. Just no. seems to be throwing in a bit wild from too far away. So could give him another chance, maybe against someone a bit less experienced. Maybe yeah. another debut time would be a good, good shout. Yeah, yeah. He was sort of measuring with that lead hand and then throwing that straight right. Um, just think it was just his first fight. Didn't know what to expect. But yeah, as I say, very marketable, brought a really, really big crowd down. So yeah. I'm sure in that sense, he's, he's, he's done that side of things right. Um, the fighting in, in that sense is the easy part, really, because marketing yourself yeah. can be very, very difficult, especially in bare knuckle boxing. So, yeah, I'd give him another shot. I don't think we saw what we would have liked to have seen from him. We didn't see what he's all about. So, yeah, I'd like to see him maybe in there with someone like Matthew Hodgson, you know, and um Give him another shot. But Stephen Evans, super impressed, moves on, hopefully to a British title. That's what he was talking about in my post-fight interview of him. So, yeah, another one to watch. Remember the name, Stephen Evans. Second fight of the night, super welterweight. That's Daniel Lerwell's division between Lawrence Tracy and Darren Godfrey Jr. Now, in the lead-up, Lawrence Tracy told me that he was tailor-made for bare knuckle boxing. I said, you can certainly talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? pretty much showed that a really really impressive performance wonderful inside fighting um very 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 fast hands and looked to be everything that i expected from him um showed some really nice angles and some sophistication that you wouldn't usually see from an mma fighter just really overall very impressed i thought he was helped somewhat by the way that darren godfrey approached the fight he is usually a slow starter but he really took the fight to Lawrence Tracy just caught in that pocket stationary too many times leaning on his man which allowed crucially Lawrence Tracy to land those uppercuts and those uppercuts were really the telling shots that that won him the fight he was dropped three times in that bout and yeah super super impressed and it was a bit of a shame because there was moments there yeah. where I saw what Godfrey Jr. could do you know yeah. from range he was landing some, some quite nice straight shots he's got some very fast hands himself and just one of those guys that I always watch and I just think there's portions there where you show that real quality that you have. So, again, disappointed for Darren, but uh, a great platform fight for Lawrence Tracy. Yeah, definitely agree. I think Darren, it may be a bit too brave for his own good, wanting to get involved in a scrap a bit too much. His yeah. best success when he's when he kept it 
the rare times when he kept it a bit longer. Yeah. If you look at Tracy, he seems to have quite a short reach. His build, his height, and just his general arm span seem to be the sort of shorter fighter, sort of Mike Tyson style. He's not a jabber, not the straight punches. He's sort of short, or the hooks and uppercuts up in the pocket. And Darren lowered himself physically to Tracy's level. And that means when you're both in the pocket, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, especially with a short fighter, it's kind of 50-50. And you're allowing yourself, exposing yourself to that danger of flipping a coin, who's going to land the big shot first on the inside. But as we know, it's the shots you don't see coming that knock you out. And when you're so close up, it's much easier to miss something sneaky. And that's what those uppercuts were, sneaky inside, and they were devastating. Good performance from Tracy. Darren, great fighter. I just think he came in with the wrong game plan on this one. Mm, definitely. Yeah, I think so. I think he spoiled his work in that sense. You know, as he was leaning onto his man, that presented the uppercut, and that was really, you know, the end of the fight. But talking about Lawrence Tracy, obviously there's a vacant British title at Super Welterweight. I've seen a little bit of talk between Mason Shaw and Lawrence Tracy just now before we started this recording. So why not? Next up, middleweights, Gavin Kura versus Tom Doyle. Now, this was an interesting fight. Obviously, Kura was supposed to be fighting Chris Trasize on the night for the British middleweight title. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Chris Trasize pulled out. Kura's been on the BKB card for God knows how long. He was supposed to fight Joey Vaughan, if you remember, about a year and a half ago. So really nice to finally see him in the BKB ring and... For me, it was really impressive. Um, Tom Doyle obviously taking this one on short notice, so maybe not at his best and maybe not an evenly matched opponent in that sense. But very tough man who got up multiple times and, you know, got into that second round and in that sense impressed me with his toughness and his durability. But, um, yeah, there was a difference here in class. I think Kura was landing that double jab, throwing the double jab to back Doyle up against the ropes and then he'd unload a vicious right hand, whether it was to the body or to the head. And ultimately, that was the telling shot, the, the right hand off the double jab. Just super aggressive, really impressed me. Um, cut off every angle, just like a raging bull, you know, went after Tom Doyle and landed with vicious intent. I think he dropped him three times or four times in total. Just really, really impressed. And actually, having watched that fight, really looking forward to him versus Chris Trasize. But the fight was not without its controversy. I'll fire this one over to you, Paolo, for a bit of analysis. But it <laughs> seems as though there was a, a few late shots. Yes. Um, I think in the, the third time, the third knockdown, um, when, when Tom Doyle went down, he did touch down. And I think there was a sufficient delay after the after that his knee went down. That Gavin put a punch in. Obviously, similar situation to Chaz Simmons, wasn't it? It was. When he was a bit late, didn't get noticed this time by the referee. But at the end of the day, I don't think it would have changed the result of the fight. I don't think anyone would. It's inconsequential, really, to the end of the fight. I thought Gavin was fantastic. I didn't know much about him. Um, but when he came in, I saw the Repton ABC tattoo. I thought, this guy is going to be shit hot. He's yeah. going to be good. And you could just tell he's so experienced. He looks like he's, because of his frame, his height, he seems to be short for his weight class. That's why he's always got to push the action. Mm. And he's doing a lot of slip jabs, which short people in their class tend to do to get inside the reach. And he changed levels so well, didn't he, George Gavin? I think the first two knockdowns are both very similar. Two shots to body then coming back up with a left hook. Tom's chin was a little bit in the air at some points, especially when he's up against the ropes. A lot of people tend to do that when they're up against the ropes. They just anxiously go like that. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, I think Tom was probably the best last-minute replacement we've had. I thought he... Every time he got up after a knockdown, he wasn't looking for a way out. He wasn't pointing to his eye or nothing. And he got up and threw shots after every knockdown, so... Yeah, I think he, fair play to him. Obviously not his best performance because he no. came in late, but I was, I was impressed with his heart anyway. And I want to see Gavin challenged at a higher level because I think he's going to be great. 
and Tom comes from a professional boxing background, so it's not just some mug you've brought in. It was it was very mm. impressive from Gavin, and uh, yeah, Tom showed his toughness as he shared. We've got to give a lot of respect to him because you see these guys are coming on short notice and they just fold instantly. <laughs> it just, yeah, Tom you know, didn't. Tom didn't. He just kept, he kept getting up. He kept going, and, and a lot of respect to him. He took a very damaging shot to the neck, as we saw yeah. with Pole and Reza in on the previous card. Yes. Really exposed area, very damaging shots. So you know he kept going, and and for me, I've got a lot of respect for both men coming out of that fight. Back in the win column for Charlie Milner, a big yes. first round TKO victory against Tony Barrett at heavyweight. Doesn't come any sweeter than that, Paolo. No, fantastic news for Charlie. We are obviously did that before him as well. Obviously, coming, I think, off back-to-back -back losses, first-round KO win, best you can get, isn't it? Best feeling, back-to-winning ways. And it was a great performance as well. It was only quick, but I think in that short amount of time, you could see Charlie's jab looks absolute lightning. His hand speed looks unbelievably fast. I was dead impressed. And also... As you're a taller guy, a lot of people are going to be jabbing to the body. Great way to combat that is counter left hook as they're coming out. Check Orthodox it. people lean to the right as they're throwing the jabs to the body. And then obviously, Orthodox person countering that left hook on the exit. And Charlie caught him with a few times. Great work from him. Uh, need to see more from Tony. It's over a bit quickly to get any, any gauge on his performance. But... Um, yeah, great performance from Charlie. Need to see more from Tony. Yeah, finally, we got to see Charlie using his jab, using his range effectively. He's got an 86-inch reach. I believe it's 86. It might be 85. Regardless, it's disgustingly long. Like, it's literally up there with Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua. It's an unbelievable reach. And we just haven't seen him use it effectively. We kind of saw it against Eric Olsen, but there wasn't much action in that. He just took the fight to Tony. We know he's a powerful puncher. We know he's got a lot of range. So what did he do? He went in there. He marched him down, but he didn't get too stuck in. He kept it at range. He kept it classy. And then, you know, I think it was a jab, actually, that hurt Tony initially. And then he just swarmed him, didn't he? It was a, it was a right uppercut. So it was a jab that initially sort of shook him a bit. And then it was a beautiful right uppercut that really shook him. And then, yeah, Tony took a knee. It seemed a bit of a premature stoppage from the corner. I'm not quite sure who it was. I mean, the, the towel came in. I don't know if that was Tony's decision or the corner's decision, but I thought it was a bit early, to be honest with you. I, I, I didn't see Tony protesting. I don't want to question whether or not he did it or not, but I, I thought it was a bit weird at the time. Obviously, he was definitely hurt by Charlie there, but yeah, a bit of an odd finish. But regardless, you know, Charlie moves to two and two now and rebuilds himself up for hopefully a British title shot in the future in a couple of fights. I think the thing that made it a bit odd is the knockdown is that it was like a delayed reaction. It yeah. wasn't a shot that tipped him over and he got flattened on his on the floor. He seemed to absorb the shots and two seconds later his body was like, no, I'm yeah. going down. So that might have been why the table went in because it what no balance came into it. It's just like... Mm oh shit, I've been hit here and I've stayed hit. So yeah, it's the normal onlook. It might have looked a bit early, but I think that might have been a bit bit of a scary, uh, oh my gosh, what has happened there after two seconds delay? Bit of realisation of what he's got himself in for. I think, I think Charlie, you know, shocked a few people. Tony, I was watching in the build-up, looked to be quite a decent little boxer. Mm. Very powerful, very fast, very fast. But um, Charlie looked the faster, which is very surprising. You know, when you've got those long arms, it's a it's a long distance to travel. And yeah, honestly, I just, you know, we've said we were impressed with him against Podmore. He keeps improving. He just keeps improving and couldn't happen to a nicer guy. So, yeah, congratulations, Charlie. Long may it last. From one lovely bloke to another, Callan Harley defeating Jamie Oldfield. I think it was a flyweight, about 69 kilograms. Two men coming in on short notice. I, uh, I contacted Jamie Oldfield to see if he was up for the fight. Took it on short notice. Absolute fair play to him. I believe he was supposed to fight someone else and then Callan Harley came in later. But, you know, two great guys and a really, really genuinely entertaining fight. Went the distance, which we needed, to be honest with you, for night. In the last two cards, we've seen so many finishes. It was really nice to see 
a unanimous decision. So that was that was brilliant. But yeah, Callan Harley, really impressive. I think the difference here was in the shape, you know, the shape and the fundamentals of Callan Harley. We saw Oldfield getting caught with his chin up in the air, untucked, you know, reaching and extending a bit too much, diving into range a bit too um, erratic. In comparison, Harley, he kept his composure, he kept his distance, he kept his range. He did everything that we wanted to see from a bare knuckle boxer. And to me, he looks to be a good additive to that 69 kilogram division. Not sure how low he can go, but who knows, might even be able to get into the minimum weight. So we've got another good fighter around those lower weights. But yeah, entertaining fight. I mean, Jamie Oldfield, a horse couldn't knock him out. I mean, the man has got a chin of steel. We saw that in the John Hick fight. He went the full distance with him, took some gnarly, gnarly shots and just kept marching forwards. And obviously, as we know, John Hick is the man who holds the record for the world's fastest knockdown in BKB history. So, you yeah, know, Jamie nice. Oldfield, a very legit chin, being chin checked many times. So, yeah, both men, I think, really put on a worthy performance. But as I say, it was the cleaner work. It was the more composed and it was the, the better shaped and more fundamentally sound Callan Harley, which allowed him to get off those better shots in the exchanges because they were just going at each other, smashing heads like two balls. And yeah, really entertaining fight. Correct. Fight number five was the first to go to the judges' scorecards. The judges were getting lazy with the previous four fights, all ending in a stoppage. In fact, most of the fights were a stoppage. I think nine out of the 12 ended early. So it's an easy night for the judges. Didn't use much paper. Callan Harley, Jamie Oldfield. I thought it was a nice little scrap. Fun little free, free rounder to watch. I think Jamie started off the first round a bit aggressive, backing up Callan, and it was it looks like Jamie's in the first the opening minute, opening thirty seconds. Yeah. But Callan came back with the clean shots, and that's what the really eye catching got me. As he said, I thought Jamie had his chin too high in the air, and when you get caught with your chin in the air, it looks twice as bad. Yeah, and that's why you get. Or the woos from the crowd because you go like that. It's, snapped it's just yeah, not looking, not looking great. He, as he said, he's got a great chin and he's giving all the bravado, sticking his tongue out, beating his chest because he wasn't, he wasn't really hurt at any point. Personally, I'm not a big fan of of the bravado because to me that's a red flag saying I just got hit. Yeah, you don't want to be waving that at the referee, the judges, or your opponent. But he never seen trouble, Jamie. To be fair. Uh, Callan, I was impressed by him, yeah. I thought it was a commendable performance by both. Fun little fight. And, uh, yeah, get him back on soon. Yeah, about as good as it gets for a short-notice fight. I think both men, if you had them on a full camp, it'd be even better. So, yeah, yeah. super impressed. Lightweight division next. Conan Barbaru defeating John Doody by second-round TKO. Wow. I mean, we know what to expect from Conan Barbaru. It's... Uh, it's a little bit like that DVD that you find underneath your dad's bed, that porno that you shouldn't have watched thousands of times, but you, you keep watching it and, and you feel dirty every single time you watch it, but you, you watch it regardless. You know, revelation there, ladies and gents, from George. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, when you watch Barbara, you just you're watching it and you're like, God, this is dirty. Why am is I watching mom? this? Is that mom? Yeah, is that... <laughs> no, no, no. That's definitely not it. No home video. It's, it's, it's just rough. It's violent. The man just encapsulates the serial killer mentality every time he walks out. Although I have to say, very disappointed that he didn't walk out to the Saw theme tune this time. I will, I will pick up on that. But regardless, you just know what to expect from Conan Barbaru. Wild swings, puts all of his body into every shot. And as we saw, <laughs> a bit of a windmill effect flying into the corner. In that end of the yeah, it's like a Tasmanian devil. He almost got him with a, a spinning back heel, wasn't it? <laughs> he went off like, it was as if he was um, taken by the wind when he went over there. But yeah. hey, it, it works. You know, you can, you can watch that and you can think, yeah. oh, you know, Oh, he's not this, he's not that. But the guy literally sparks people out. And Nathan De Castro, as we say, how close was that fight? <laughs> like he's so unorthodox, it I've... it really throws people off. And you saw that with Doody throughout the whole fight. He was just like, 
what am I what am I dealing with the whole time? Those those overhands were coming over. But we did see a bit of adjustment, a bit of sophistication from Conan this time. He was faking to the body with that left hand, and that brought down Dudi's guard, which allowed him to land the overhand on a few occasions. And we're just seeing little improvements here and there. While he stays authentic to himself and stays authentic to his character, we're seeing these little adjustments, these little bits he's picking up in training. And, you know, the more that he improves, the more dangerous he gets, because the guy packs a serious punch and the wild unorthodox nature of him means that he's always landing but you know the finish was a nice little adjustment he missed that overhand saw that Doody had ducked down check little left hook boom hardly landed it was so yeah. he's so powerful <laughs> you heard it when you're so in there. easy to miss Loads yeah. of people missed it yeah it was so such a little like a little dink that you, you didn't notice it at the time but Doody definitely did, but, you know, gutted for Doody. Another really nice guy on the card. Um, he was there filming me while I was throwing up in the chili challenge. So a lot of respect <laughs> for that man. But, yeah, no, just another really nice guy that, unfortunately, we saw lose on the night. But, yeah, hopefully, maybe we see him get matched up with someone around his level. Um, but, yeah, well done, Conan Barbara. I think Conan is a nightmare to fight, a nightmare to ref. He's a nightmare full stop from Transylvania, <laughs> from the depths of hell. It's just, I felt sorry for Doody because I think in terms of levels, Conan and Doody were probably on a similar level. But yeah. when it comes to how unorthodox Conan is, what do you do with that? It, mm. It's like if you get a boxer versus a street fighter, sometimes a street fighter is so wild and mental, a boxer yeah. will think, what am I doing here? It's just crazy. He, it stylistically, it didn't match up that great because mm. I think they both have got very wide stances. The feet are very far apart, yeah. which reduces the mobility forward and backwards. If you just try yourself at home, getting your boxing stance and just widen it an extra half a yard, and you'll notice how your balance and movement changes. So they will throw in from far out of range, and that's why you tended to get a bit of inactivity, and then sort of falling into each other. Stylistic nightmare, but there's fun, there's a bit of drama, there's a bit of boxing, there's a bit of rugby, and a very skilled knockout with the cheeky left on the inside. So an interesting one, I think. Long live Conan. And um, John, I hope you get someone normal next fight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I just have this weird feeling that Conan... It's just going to somehow become a world champion. I can just, I can actually genuinely just see it happening. Yeah. I can see him just getting in there with someone, someone, you know, some former WBC champion and him just winging an overhand and putting him into a coma. I could, I genuinely wouldn't even be surprised. The guy is mental. And one of our favorites here at Toe the Line, obviously we, yeah. we absolutely love Conan and we love to see him on, on winning track. So super, another really big feel good moment on the card. So yeah, super impressed Conan. From one Romanian to another, Ionel Levici defeated Rhys Murray by second round TKO. 2 0 to the Romanians. Another very aggressive Romanian in Levici. Really impressed me, actually. Marched down Murray. As the smaller man, obviously, he needed to get into that pocket and he needed to get into there fast. And I think Murray may just have stylistically allowed him to do that. Rather than establishing that jab and, and moving around, he was trying to catch Levici coming in. And it worked to an extent. I think he got the cleaner work off in the first round, but it did allow Levici to get inside. And you do not let Levici inside. In his first fight at BKB9, he punched a hole in Mohamed Khan's head. A literal hole. I'm not even joking. A hole. Watch, look at the x-ray. The guy's got a hole in his skull now. So, you know, do not let this guy on the inside. He's got freakish power and he's violent. He strikes with violent intent. I know Levici, I'm telling you this now, this man is a dangerous, dangerous man and he will become a contender at the featherweight division. I'm telling you now, he will become a contender. We're hoping to see him in January. I think he won't be able to make November. He's got a boxing bout, so we should see him early next year. But yeah, again, Murray, just another one I'm gutted for because he's so good. He's just so good. 
The fundamentals are on fleek. He's showing some nice little angles. He's shimmying. He's moving. He's doing everything you want to see. There's not really a single technical difference wrong with him. It was just a game plan on the day. He is a better boxer than Levici. I think Levici will admit that. I think Murray is one of the top boxers in BKB. Really, really impressed. And, you know, a loss of this magnitude, I think, will propel him. I think he will learn from this. I think he will come out better. I don't think he was as prepared as maybe he should have been. We had a, a little chat about that after the fight. But, yeah, Levici just swarmed him. And the shot that he hit him with was disgusting. Really? It was a it was a really tight overhand right. He kept it really in tight, kept that elbow tucked and just looped it on. And it caught him right in that left eye. And that's ultimately what made the fight stop. He couldn't see out of his left eye. He took away complete vision from that left eye. And yeah, really turned the tide of the fight. But yeah, you do not give Levici space. This man, <sighs> this man is dangerous. Yeah, definitely the right decision, because if you can't see out of one eye, obviously dangerous fighting, but especially dangerous fighting someone short, who you've got to sort of look down on and see the distance because they all throw shorter people tend to throw hooks, looping mm. shots that come from the side. And that's really when you need your peripheral vision. So, yeah, right decision from um, the corner of the referee. It's a difficult, difficult night for Reese, really. Um, Slovici was so aggressive. I think could have thrown a little bit more Reese potentially. Definitely. But I suppose it's a tricky one, really, isn't it? Oh, sorry, mate. Fuck it. Trying to keep your first half on that. Just go. Just keep going from where you were. Where was I? Um, Difficult night for Reese. Yeah. Um, Difficult night for Reese. I think he could have done with dominating that gap between the two with his jab more, just putting something in that space because he seemed to be backing up without throwing anything, which was just letting Levici come forward. That's Levici, uh, Einel Levici, not to be confused with Lionel Richie, the balladist from the 80s who, sing, who sang Say You, Say Me, Hello, <laughs> and uh, Dancing on the Ceiling. I thought... I thought, like, who's fighting when I heard him announce it? It's Ino Levici. I was like, oh, my God, is his music gone that bad? He's had to turn to bare knuckle <laughs> to get money through the door. But it wasn't him. Um, instead, <laughs> it was a very hard-hitting, accurate Romanian bare knuckle boxer. So, good night. Ended a good night. In fact, thank you, Reese, for the vino. Obviously, you oh. bought some for George, didn't you? But uh, he's not into the wine, so uh, I polished yeah. that off. On behalf of Toe the Lion. Yeah, I just want to say to the people that I am completely teetotal. I'm a, a man of, of health and wealth. So obviously I did not have the wine. Um, Paolo, he does all the, the dirty stuff for me. So um, yeah, it was it was a good night with Reese. to be fair. We had a, me, you, Johnny Lawson, Reese Murray and Paul Hills back at the hotel. That was a, that was a cracking night, you know. I was the only one that remembered anything. I won't go into too much details, but let's just put it this way. I shared a room with Johnny Lawson and uh, yeah, that my, that man drank too much. So uh, well, we won't go into details about, about what he did after he drank too much, but uh, it was quite similar to uh, when I took the chilli on in the chilli challenge. So yeah, it was a brilliant night. Um, as you say, I just think that Reese he needed to be a little bit more active. And although he was throwing a few fakes in there Levici sort of got the fact that those were just going to be fakes and not shots and when he was biting them on them early he got the message that that was just a fake it was just going to be a fake and he was sort of goading him in to to land the shot and that allowed Levici to go okay that's a fake boom as he was sort of half extending a shot and that's where he was able to get in and, and catch him with those good shots so yeah, Levici, super impressed. Again, don't write off Reese Murray. I really do yeah. think this guy's one for the future. And um, yeah, on to the next one for both of them. Two big fights, I'm sure, for both men. It's a good performance for Reese in the second. The first round was quiet, but I think the second round he adjusted and came out and showed us his potential. Unlucky that Levici managed to get in shortly into the second, but I was really impressed by the way Reese came out for the second. So if he fights like that straight away off the bat in future, I think, as you said, definitely one to watch for future. On to our first of three 
performances of the night. We actually went for the same three people, so that's pretty cool. Tony Lafferty defeating Johnny Lawson by third round TKO. That TKO coming via cuts, which is always unfortunate, especially for Johnny, who, let's be honest, was going to be in there for the full five. But yeah, super impressed by Tony, the first man to ever stop t- to stop Johnny, even if it was on cuts. And the first man to really hurt Johnny to the head as well, a, a straight right, which backed up Johnny and made him initially take that knee, which led to the doctor coming in and checking the cut. But wow, Tony Lafferty, so improved. He's always been a slick fighter. He's always had that potential. I think the adjustment here was where in the past he's moved his head beautifully and and evaded shots. He was coming back. And that's what he was saying in the lead up. I need to come back with shots. I'm I'm opening up my opponent to counters, but I'm not utilizing it and that that was really the difference he was rolling he was coming coming back with nice straight shots nice hooks he was getting a few a few little pull counters in there as well you know lots of nice variety and everything that he did and composed and controlled finally finally we saw this with ricky nelder as well um you know a brawler turned into a boxer and and they looked so much better as boxers you know he didn't get drawn into the fights that johnny lawson really wanted there was actually i i say that I don't know if you remember at the start of that second round, I nearly had a heart attack when they started swinging in that corner. My goodness, that was probably the best exchange of the night. Um, If this had gone five, I really do think we'd be looking at fight of the night, but just a bit early with with the stoppage, um, unfortunately. But wow, what a fight. I mean, Johnny, he really took the fight to Tony, but so, so clean and so composed and so impressed by this new Tony Lafferty. We've been waiting for him to come back to the ring for so long. He's been on the phone to me every day telling me how it's the new Tony Lafferty. You know, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. But talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. And wow, did he impress. All right, Tony, the Tiger did change his stripes for this fight. I was really impressed. And it's the same reason we both gave him one of our performances of the night because he just came so different and that's what I think put Johnny off he he said himself didn't he he was just bamboozled by this patient Tony I mean normally you're expecting just this guy to come marauding forward um he'll close the range he'll be chest to chest hold referee splits it and repeat that was Tony's old come forward meet in the middle hold ref splits it repeat but this time, he's actually turning his man. He was going around his man, mm. using his feet to reset and get back in the centre of the ring, which is a really impressive boxer's trick, using your feet, keeping the centre of the ring while still being agile. Before, he didn't used to have those feet. He just let the referee sort him out later on. Um, very accurate jab from him that opened up those complex cuts in Johnny. Around here, the skin is very thin inside your eyes, around your nose there. And when I saw, when we saw Johnny's cuts, the, I overheard the medics saying between himself, like, I don't want that. One of the medics said to his colleague, you can do that, I'm not doing that. Mm. Because of the complexity of it, it was inside here, the crook of the eye, over the nose, and obviously blood all over it. So it was just a great jab that opened the cuts, but I'm afraid it wasn't safe for Johnny to carry on with that lack of vision. He didn't seem buzzed, but it's just that lack of vision. I think he definitely hurt him with a straight right, which yeah, back up. But ultimately, to knock out Johnny Lawson is pretty much the most impossible thing in the world. But like, this is crazy because, you know, look at the last two cards. I'm talking about who I believe have the two best chins in BKB and Mickey Parker and Johnny Lawson. And both of them got hurt on back-to-back yeah, cards. Happening? What's happening? Nothing is sacred anymore. I thought Mickey Parker and Johnny Lawson's chins were the only unfathomed things in BKB, and now now everything's getting broken. You know, my I mean my my ass got broken when I uh, took that chili. So you know, <laughs> I, I thought he was going to say after staying in the hotel room with Johnny. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. no talking about this uh, this scratch DVD before. Yeah. I was, I'm getting a bit worried, mate. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is why I get bullied because I just open myself up to it, to be honest with you. But, you know, <laughs> life, life goes on. But, yeah, no, as I say, mate, really impressed by Tony and just gutted for Johnny, really gutted for Johnny. Because yeah, he looked 
Petit looks improved as well. You know, I saw him rolling underneath and coming back with the left hook, keeping yeah. it a lot tighter than usual. He usually telegraphs his shots a lot more. He was definitely tucking those elbows in more. He was more accurate than usual. He's always wild and swings for the fences. But um, yeah, surprisingly, we saw in that fight against Chas Simons where his work rate came around in the third round, you know, he uh, he managed to maintain it. So obviously a really big increase in stamina that extra few rounds working on the five rounds will have helped. But yeah, he looked he looked fit, fit he looked healthy. Uh, be nice to see him fight someone maybe like maybe like a Reese Murray. But then equally, that style doesn't necessarily gel too well. I, I want him to fight an all out brawler. We need Johnny Lawson in an all out brawl. That's what we expected in the Tony Lafferty fight. Unfortunately, we didn't get it. Obviously, we can't blame Tony for that. He's he's gone up levels in that sense. But um, yeah, Johnny Lawson must fight a brawler next. We need an all-out war. Next up, getting to the business end of the card now, Ricky Nelder versus Ashley Gibson. Was supposed to be CJ Mills, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, actually, which we saw Paul Toby Binden out the card as well. It was changed. It was changed to a guy called Carl James Goodwin. Then he pulled out and then... Mr. Last Minute Ashley Gibson stepped in. And do you know what? For a man that steps in on last minute, he always impresses me. Yeah. Really, really impressed again by Gibson. Sticking in there for five rounds. The guy, he'll say himself, barely trains. <laughs> he really yeah, does. He barely trains. He, he turns up, he loves the scrap. Well. Yeah, he turns up, he loves the scrap. But um, yeah, for him to stick in there for five rounds against one of the hardest hitters of all time, one of the most durable guys, Ashley Gibson. And yeah, did some did some nice stuff there. A few times he's taken his eye off the ball, which allowed Ricky to come in with a few uppercuts and, and force the action. But ultimately, in terms of technique, I think that was one of Ashley's better performances. He paced it. Well, he didn't pace it well. I think Ricky Nelder was more in control of the pace, but I think the pace benefited both men, if you know what I mean. Ricky, obviously, previously a bit of a brawler, comes in, gets in for a scrap. This time we saw him showing some nice little angles. You know, I've seen him throw a touch jab hook a couple of times in there. Some real technical shots. You know, we expect these sort of little deviations from um, from Jimmy Sweeney. But wow, Ricky Nelder was really, really good. He was he was effective using the high guard. We, we've said in previous fights that the high guard, you know, it's, it's not the best defensive technique to use in bare knuckle boxing due to that small fist that can slip through the guard but he was catching things up on on the forearm and the elbow which we also saw with Paul Hills which we'll get on in the next couple of fights but you know two guys on the night that showed an effective high guard which which traditionally isn't a particularly effective way of defending yourself he was he was slapping away shots he was he was taking away the lead hand of Ashley Gibson and ultimately just in complete control I think I gave him all five rounds Ashley had a few rounds where he was competitive but ultimately yeah, all five, all five to Ricky Nelder in a very clever performance. Agreed, Ricky. You never needed to retire. You could have stayed in. Yeah. That's that said, the break could have done him good. This is, it was still Ricky Nelder, still had his signature stance, sort of yeah. low guard leaning forward, but he seemed more intelligent, more composed, a lot smoother. He said he's been working on his boxing in his interview with you, George, didn't he? And I think that showed just subtle changes. He even had borrowed some elements from Cuban style boxing about never blocking, just use your feet to get out of the way, low guard and just get out of the way, take a little step back. And that ultimately, I think, was the best thing for him is keeping control of the distance. Ricky decided to fight when he wanted to fight and not to fight when he didn't want to. Occasionally, he did get revert back to type and go in a few exchanges, but Cornerman told him off, said, stop doing that. And that's when Ash had his best work was when Ricky stayed in too long. Rather than get in, do you work and yeah. get out? If Ricky stayed in too long, that's when Ash got those brilliant uppercuts in yeah. that were really good. Really liked watching Ash with his uh, cross guard, you know, traditional... What you see more in American heavyweights in 90s, uh, we don't see as much anymore. Um, but yeah, it's fun and it, it works for him. Fun little fight and uh, great performance from Ricky. Yeah, as you say, he was, he was for the majority of the fight, staying on the inside with the guard high. And then he'd step out of range, take a little, a little step, tiniest little bit. And then as Ashley ducked low, presented that head and came over, 
he take that little tiny little step back, that small adjustment, drop the guard and fire a check left hook from the hip. And it was just a fantastic adjustment to make, particularly in those later rounds. I think it was the fifth round. He really started to land that check left hook. But yeah, just intelligence. We saw IQ beyond his years in that sense, you know, for a guy that's been fighting that long and has just been getting into brawls and, you know, just really getting rugged and, and fighting a, a certain style of fights to see him revert from type and do something completely different was really refreshing. And for me, again, I'm, you were the same Ricky Nelder, the second performance of the night for us. Craig Rocky Morgan versus Lewis Gallant next, the British flyweight title on the line. If you're wondering why we have such red eyes, we've just been laughing for the last five, 10 minutes over a, a small comment that I may or may not have made, but regardless Craig Rocky Morgan versus Lewis Gallant. Super impressive performance from Craig Rocky Morgan. He picks up the British title, second round TKO, and just as per usual, really, really impressive. The most criminally underrated guy in BKB for me. Super, super impressed. I think he's always active. He's so, so active. He just moves everything. His body is constantly moving. And with that movement, it allows him to crucially close that distance as he's moving his head, as he's moving his body, he just edges those feet in. And Lewis Gallant, he was focusing on the body, didn't notice that as he was moving his body, he was edging his feet forwards and suddenly he's in range. And then he pounces on you like a tiger. I mean, Craig Rocket Morgan is about as powerful as you get. He plants his feet, he throws with serious intent and the guy just closes distance instantly. But equally, Lewis Gallant did the right thing. He smothered a lot of Craig's work, which allowed him to get into that second round. He'd throw from range. And if he missed, he'd quickly close the distance and grab the clinch. And he did what you would crucially do in a survival situation. To be honest with you, Lewis actually did impress me. And I think he definitely has a future in BKB. Obviously, he fought quite some time ago. We haven't seen him. He's had, I want to say that was his seventh fight. I think he was two, three and one coming into that fight. Um, fought some good lads, beat, beat Liam James, a former world champion from a long time ago, who also, you know, beat Kevin Bennett, who was a very, very impressive guy from back in the day. Fought Chris Lytle as well. I think that was his last outing at BKB9. But ultimately, Lewis Gallant, after a long time out, I thought he looked really good. And, you know, another guy at those lower weights that we can we can bring in as a good addition. But yeah, Craig Rocky Morgan, he just... He just impresses me so much every time he gets in there. He's just vicious. And for me, that was the knockout of the night. That beautiful right uppercut. And <clears throat> important to note, he didn't hit and hold. He rested his hand on his back. So he actually used the same momentum that you'd get from that pulling back from the neck. But he pulled him into the shot and just fired that right uppercut there. And it was a horrific connection. I mean, in, yeah. in person, it was you could hear it. You could hear it. You could really hear that connection. So for me, you know, Craig Rocky Morgan, one of the top 10 hardest hitters in BKB, and he's proven that every time he steps in the ring. Definitely. Great knockout. I think your potentially your knockout of the night, my mm -hmm. second favourite stoppage of the night. Yeah. As usual, Craig, fantastic performance. He's the Mr. Tumble of BKB. Mr. Tumble from the CBBS programme does the sign language at the start of every fight. He does his little... Little signal, I think that's to his daughters, that's their thing, isn't it? He does that at the start, <laughs> then at the end, at the knockout, he does that, which is... Sign oh, bedtime. that was sick when he went... <sighs> yeah, that means over, that means bedtime. So, yeah, he's um, communicating with everyone. See if you can't hear them over the crowd. Great performance from him. I think the most impressive thing about Craig, and always has been, has been his use of feet to get in and out of range. And when you couple that with his power that's when you get such a devastating fighter because he'll go in, do the damage, get out, which makes it very one-sided in that he fights when he wants to. Yeah. Very aggressive, kept the centre of the ring. Very impressed. Um, the first knockdown was good as well, wasn't it? We missed that. I think that was about a minute, half, maybe halfway through the first round approximately. That was nice. Um I think that was a body shot, actually, right to the right up to the body. I was going to say it was. I'm trying to look over here. Yes, it was a right to the body. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, obviously the knockout was an uppercut, which was absolutely vicious. Fantastic shots, very accurate. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, no, super impressed. And, and, a, and a key thing you notice, especially when you're watching Craig Rocky Morgan in the flesh, when you're there watching the shows live, 
he never takes his eyes off his opponent. You know, the look yeah. that he gives them is very, very scary. Um, a lot of fighters choose to change where they look. I, he might be able to correct me on this one, but it seems as though he's looking a bit higher than usual. Usually they tell you to look around the collarbone area, but it looks like he's looking in their eyes. Might be wrong. Craig can correct me on that one, but it does look like he's locking eyes with his opponent. But regardless, he never takes his eye off his opponent. Super focused. He's, you know, he's really dialed in. And ultimately that allows him to be so vicious and so accurate. And, you know, he, he doesn't switch off. His defense is as good as his offense. He really is one to watch. And really for us, the guy who was kind of the unofficial number 11 on our pound for pound list, mm -hmm. I think he was just edged out by Anthony Holmes. But if we if we had seen him fight John Hick on the night, which was the fight we had been promised, obviously John Hick pulled out. I think we would have definitely seen him in the pound for pound. But ultimately, yeah. level of competition, he does have that nice win over Scott McHugh, of course. But um, yeah. I think off ability alone, he'd definitely be in that top 10, but just resume kind of just edged out on the top 10. This was a big discussion we had the other day, wasn't it? And we were saying that he's been more active. So if there's one or two more shows yeah. where Rocky's on them and Anthony's not, then we may have to, you know, bump up Craig and move Anthony slightly off. He is definitely on the fringe of, of it, Craig, and he's... he's it's difficult pound for pound list, isn't it? Because you get so many different opinions. It's very subjective. Mm. Some people don't agree with them at all because yeah. it's all in your head. It's like, it's the classic, if my gran had wheels, would she have been a bike? Sort of <laughs> hypothetical, doesn't matter, does yeah. it? Because they're never going to fight anyway. But Craig <laughs> definitely is on the fringe of that pound for pound list and could make his way on soon. Yeah, I, I think he will. Um, Tony Lafferty, another one who I think a few wins he'll he'll look to to get back up there. Um, there's loads of really good guys outside of the list, and do you know what? Surprisingly for this one, I've not had a single death threat, so that was lovely. <laughs> that was really refreshing. I had even comments saying, "Great list, can't argue with that. Good job." I was, do you know what? I thought I was living in an alternative universe because that has never happened before. I've usually had at least three fighters telling me they're going to stab me at the next show. That's a lie, of course, it's a joke. Um, but no, fans, to be fair, I've had actually some really vicious comments on fans. <laughs> yes, guys, get them in. Like, subscribe, get your death threats in. Yeah. George monitors yeah. the inbox, not me. So get your death threats in. Tell him what you're going to do. Chop him up, blow his house up, and get him in. If it's over anything, if it's about a fight you don't even know, have a go at him anyway. He loves yeah. it. So please like, subscribe, death threat. Exactly, yeah. And also, if if you see anything to do with bare knuckle boxing that you don't like, just target it to us, even though we have nothing to do with it. <laughs> we really appreciate your comments, guys. British lightweight title fight between Paul Hills and Nathan DeCastro. I must say, <clears throat> on the broadcast, there was a bit of a, um, what would you call it? A mistake. Uh, it, was, it was put down as welterweight. I even said it in my interview because <laughs> I heard it on the on the mic even though i do know that it was lightweight so that's lightweight 79 kilograms if you have a look that was the title that nathan de castro won a lot of debate over this one for me this was fight of the night not your fight of the night but my fight of the night um really really fun fight really enjoyed it to be honest with you but a lot of debate over the result now i disagree with a lot of the fans in this sense a lot of people i think more people than any thought that paul hills had won this fight um so we've both come together. We're going to put down our personal scorecards. Obviously, again, no one get offended. This is just our personal opinion. But um, I have it 47-45 to De Castro, And I'll go through why I think each round was. I think De Castro won the first two, but he was deducted a point in both rounds, which made it a 9-9-9-9. The third round, I think he won. Um, and Hills was deducted a point in that round. So I had it as a 10-8. The fourth round, I gave to Hills. 10-9 to Paul Hills. And then the fifth, I gave 10-9 to Nathan DeCastro. So overall, 47-45 to DeCastro with the two points deducted from DeCastro and the one deducted from Hills. Are you singing the same sort of song? I don't know what your scorecard was in the end. Exactly the same, mate, for the exact same reasons. Um, I mean, every round was close. Fourth, yeah, to Paul, potentially, but I wouldn't argue if it was a DeCastro round. Yeah. Uh, ultimately... It was quite difficult to score, and I think it was a fight that really depended on your taste. I know you quite enjoyed it in Fight of the Night for you. Yeah. I personally wasn't a big fan. I don't think the styles gelled well, in my opinion. 
Um, I don't really want them to have a rematch. I mean, okay, because it was the difficult thing is it's so it wasn't clear cut. It was quite scrappy at times. A fair bit of holding. Yeah. Um. So people probably would love an ultimate one person to clearly win, mm. maybe with a stoppage or maybe just with an excellent performance that went the distance. Yeah. If I was Paul's manager, I'd be asking for the Trez fight that he was originally yeah. going to get because mm. I think he's with with the Castro. He's, he's been there and done it. The result is what it was. If he does a re, if Paul does a rematch and wins it, okay. But I think Trez would be a bigger name on his say a bigger name, a, a better fight. A, yeah, good name to have on his CV. If I was Paul's manager, I'd be asking for the Trez fight. I think Paul can be a, a victim of his own game. And this. He's happy. He's he's happy to do anything. You know what I mean? Because he's not scared of anything. Do you want to do that? Yeah, sound. Do you want to do that? Yeah, sound. And that's what we said to him afterwards. You know, after we seen him after the fight, he's, he's just so chilled out. He's so happy to fight anyone, any place, any time, any show. He's always ready. I think he's got to be a bit more selfish and say, I want this, I want that. But well, that's just a personal opinion. He's a very hard working fighter, very rugged guy, mm. absolute gentleman out of the ring. And, you know, who am I to suggest what he should do with his with his fighting career? I'm no one to say that, but I think it's time for him to be a bit more selfish with what he wants out of BKB, I think, because he's he has some tough fights, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree in that sense. Um, he's obviously fought Jack Armfield, Barry Jones and Nathan DeCastro, all yeah. extremely credentialed professional boxers. Um, <clears throat> in regards to your fight of the night uh, comments, I think for me, the reason it was fight of the night for me was a fight of the night for me is a competitive fight. A competitive fight, yeah. which ultimately for, it was entertaining. I think it was really entertaining. But um like your your fight of the night, not to dispute it, of course, it was a very, you know, eventful fight of the night. We'll, we'll not give it away. Well, we will give it away. It's Sweeney versus Franco. But for me, that was quite, <laughs> <laughs> that was quite one-sided. So for me, that kind of comes across more as a performance of the night, whereas this was a really competitive fight. And there was a lot of things I liked in it. I think De Castro showed his class from mid and long range. He was landing really nice straight shots and he closed distance really quickly. Now, where he was landing those shots, he then sort of was goaded in by Paul Hills in a way. Well, not even goaded in. I think he actually initiated a lot of that clinch work. He just sort of fired and ran into him. But it would have been nice to see him just reset, reset the angle, take a little step back, a little step to the side and just go again. Because he that was where he was landing his good clean shots. And for me, in the clinch work, I actually edged pit, um, Hills. I think he did the better work. I think De Castro was landing to the body. Yeah, maybe he landed a few more body shots, but the damaging shots were the uppercuts. We saw that. We've seen De Castro. He's, he's broken his cheekbone. His face was like, you know, the Michelin man. And, you know, and Hills was barely, barely scratched in that sense. Obviously, he had a nasty black eye and, and, and had hurt his hand. But obviously, that's due to his own shots. But it was more when... De Castro, he was coming in and putting his head against the chest of Hills and Hills would just sort of slip over, move his elbow, um, sorry, his shoulder across, which would dislodge Nathan's chest from um, ch head from his chest, which then allowed him the, the space to throw the uppercut. And when yeah. he was throwing the uppercut, that for me was a lot more of a damaging shot than the shots to the body. However, I gave it to De Castro for that cleaner work when he was out on the mid and long range. I think he showed himself to be a really good boxer in portions. And to be honest with you, I think if he boxed like that, I spoke to his dad, Frank, really, really genuine guy, Frank De Castro, great trainer as well. And he's saying, you know, he just gets caught in these tear ups. And yeah. if he boxed, the way that he showed in portions of that fight. I really don't think there's many guys that are going to beat him, but he just, I don't know if he's playing up to the crowd or that's just something he enjoys doing. I think it's a mix of both, but he just gets caught in these unnecessary slugfests. And that definitely benefits someone like Paul Hills more, who really does not care about being here and really likes to be here and, and give, you know, strong shots back. That, was where Nathan De Castro fell into the wrong game. It was similar to that Conan Barbary fight. I thought a lot more entertaining. I think the Conan Barbary fight was just, uh, yeah, just very, very ugly. Um, this one we saw some nice inside fighting and it was very entertaining. But yeah, just a few point deductions, obviously holding of the ropes. Um, 
it was there was one where I can't remember what round it was in, but he grabbed his leg and and fired a shot over the top. Nathan, he's just he's a little little disciplined. A few low blows as well. There's there's a video. Um, yeah. I didn't realise on the broadcast, but someone had taken it from the crowd. He's literally landed about seven to the groin guard in a low in a row. Obviously, I do think that I don't know how high Paul's um, groin guard is, but it seems a little high to me as well at the same time. But yeah, ultimately, it was it was one of those fights where. Both men were doing stuff. Obviously, there was a, a few elbows, I think, accidental elbows thrown by Paul Hills and he was holding and hitting. There was moments in that fight, as you expect in every single De Castro fight, where it got ugly. But ultimately, for me, it was a very fulfilling five rounds. I felt like when I got to the end of it, I had been fulfilled in that sense. I'd enjoyed the entirety of the fight. It was a great fight, very competitive. And I can see why there's debate over the result. The main event of the evening, world featherweight title on the line. Obviously, if anyone was confused, it was originally called the lightweight title. We changed our weight classes. So, yeah, when they say in the intro that he won the world lightweight title, that's why. So don't it's still 76 kilograms, same belt, all that business. Don't get confused by that because I've had a few comments about that. But yeah, um, really impressive. Jimmy Sweeney, probably the best performance of his career came back after the loss two years ago and just showed everyone why he really is the number one pound for pound guy in the sport. But Paolo, this is your fight of the night. So I'll give you the floor on this one. I've been leading a bit too much, talking a bit too much. So I'll, I'll let you talk for a long time here. Not to worry, mate. I love you talking. Um, absolutely. This was my fight of the night. It also my performance of the night for Jimmy Sweeney, as he said, probably the best we've seen him. He just seemed like himself times two. He was so sharp, razor sharp. His hand speed was turned up twice. He looked so focused, unbelievably focused. Everything about him, he just seemed like a different man. Franco, I'm afraid we didn't get to see much of him because I think the fight was ended after the first knockdown in the first round. I don't think... Franco ever properly recovered from that and from there we didn't see much from him again that knockdown was reminding me of the knockdown in the first fight which was Sweeney against the ropes Franco coming forward over not overreaching potentially but just throwing using all of his range let's say I'd say he probably was overreaching in that sense yeah he was uh, he was over his knee and because it was it was a left hook into a straight right and he really lunged almost like a gazelle punch with that mm. with that left with that left hook and then sort of it was he was overreaching i think and that just allowed sweeney to just dink him with that right hand and come off to the side but yeah that was the te- that was that was the start of the end really wasn't it absolutely agree it's the very start of the as we said the very start of the end i think in the second round in the break between the first round and the second round uh, Franco said to his coach, right, is it the seventh next? Yeah. I think we saw that on um, Danny Mitchell's Insta and um, I think Rico put it on Facebook as well. That just that shot buzzed him. Going into it, I think he got caught by a small left hook and then big right hook that put him down. So Sweeney with devastating power and accuracy. Very much in the same way Barry Jones hits very hard. It's because he's accurate. Sweeney put it pinpoint on the chin, which is what did the damage. The knockdown in the, I think it's the third round that put Franco heavily down again. Again, that was just the same. Sweeney on the ropes, lean back and right hand. I don't think Sweeney was on the ropes for the third third round knockdown. Um, But again, it was just a a lean back and then right hand counter. So it's the counters for Sweeney. He was fantastic. The reason it was fight of the night for me because just the build up this absolutely mouth watering match up that didn't disappoint at all. It was phenomenal. Just the atmosphere really, really got me. You could you could cut the, the atmosphere, you could cut the tension in the room with a knife. It was just ecstatic, the atmosphere and such an emotional fight for both men. Yeah. I mean, this is a point, George, where maybe BKB aside, you look at these two men, what they've done, what they've achieved in the past year or so. Um, Sweeney's shared some awful experiences he's had in the past, I think, year, year and a half. He's battled with suicidal thoughts. 
he's battled with alcoholism, he's been really on the edge and obviously to come back from that and regain your title in such devastating fashion just shows why he's an icon of the sport and then conversely look at Franco on his deathbed nine months ago a doctor saying you're not going to do intense sport again you can't do that and then he fought on the world stage so I think these two men have essentially transcended BKB and it's just a shame that bare knuckles not more well known because yeah. this if this was happened in boxing it'd be in the news for months look at Tyson Fury went up to 28 stone depression and then he come back against Wilder if BKB just had that few more bit more mainstream media attention these men would be on the front pages of the national newspapers so big respect to both men Sweeney unbelievable performance the best I've seen him and I can't think of anyone no one with six arms and four legs in a ring could fight and beat Sweeney on that level so well done both guys uh, he was absolutely outstanding. I think for both of us, undoubtedly performance of the night. And really, in terms of performances of the night, the very peak of the night, you know. I, I like I like the way that you described why it was fight of the night, to be fair. I think there was a, a great buzz in the crowd. You know, it, it felt like, obviously, yeah, there was a great undercard. You know, we won't take that at all. We won't take that away from BKB. But ultimately, everyone was there for the main event, weren't they? You know, yeah. I mean, they were there, they were there for the fights before that. But even the guys that were there to see, you know, the Devals, the the Hillses, the De Castros, you know, they'd brought those big followings. They were ultimately there not only to see their man fight, but they were there to see Jimmy Sweeney versus Ricardo Franco, and it didn't disappoint. It was a really good fight. Um, Sweeney just so sharp, so efficient, so powerful. But you know, equally for Franco, obviously it was. You know, very disappointing for him getting hurt early. I think he yeah. was fighting on instinct throughout the whole fight, but just showed the grit and the toughness that makes Franco who he is. Yeah. That man may have lost, but ultimately he won because nine months ago he was told that he would never, ever fight. He would not fight. He would never fight again. He was told by a doctor when he said, look, I'm looking to fight. They laughed at him. A doctor yeah. laughed at him. And ultimately, he went in there and he fought the best fighter that there has ever been in bare knuckle boxing. And he put on a good account. That man deserves a trilogy down the line. I'd I, love know, one. I know that it was a very dominant performance from from um, Jimmy Sweeney. And, you know, I do think there needs to be a bit of rebuilding process there. I think it's one of those where we'll want a trilogy. Everyone wants a trilogy, but not immediately. Yeah. Let Jimmy fight a few big names from outside of the world. And no, sorry, let me stop you there, actually. Let me stop myself there. Before we go to the big names, he must fight Barry Jones. Yes. So he must he must fight Barry Jones. I mean, so let's let's have Jimmy Sweeney fight Barry Jones and a few big names and this and that. And Ricardo Frank could get a rebuild fight, you know, a, a Sean George, someone, you know, so a good, a really good. Oh, that'll be fun. Tough, yeah, a really good, tough opponent. But someone who's with absolute respect to to the name I've just mentioned and, and anyone else I'll mention in that breath, you know, James Lilly, people like that. James Lilly, another good fight that'll be um, a, a little step down, but ultimately still at a world-class level. Sean George, James Lilly, these guys are the guys that can on their day beat anyone. So he has to be at his best. But those are the sort of fights I want for him. But I'm going to go back to the point I just made. I want this to be known. I've said it everywhere, every single opportunity I had. I spoke on the Barry Jones interview. I spoke on the Ricardo Franco interview. I spoke on the Barry Jones when I when I when I was previewing the fight. Barry Jones must fight the winner of Ricardo Franco, Jimmy Sweeney. Jimmy oh, Sweeney yeah. won the fight. Ricardo Franco lost the fight. Whoever had won that would have fought Barry Jones, in my opinion. Barry Jones must fight Jimmy Sweeney next. It must happen. It is the fight that everyone wants to see. I put a poll up earlier. It was taken down, actually, because there was a bit of, um, I think, bullying or something in the comment section. So nothing to do with my post. So don't worry if anyone read into that too much and thought BKB are trying to silence me. But I put up a poll. And what did people say? Well, actually, funnily enough, they said that they wanted me versus Barry Jones second. Only. Yeah, that was the fight very, that the people wanted. People want you to get hurt, mate. Yeah, very disturbing, <laughs> actually. I'm not happy about that. And and the, and the most disturbing part of that was that Barry Jones actually voted on to fight me above uh, Jimmy Sweeney. So, but, so Barry, um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm very disappointed in you. I thought we were mates. But anyway, I'm getting I'm getting off track. I want this fight so badly. There's not been a fight like this that I've wanted more in my life. Barry Jones must fight Jimmy Sweeney because ultimately he has been untested. Ultimately, he has destroyed every man in front of him. He's fought lesser competition. I think the Paul Hills fight was the best of all of them. I think that's a good challenge, you know, a very good challenge, a British level opposition. But um, he must fight Jimmy Sweeney. Everyone wants to see it. Every man and his dog wants to see Jimmy Sweeney versus Barry Jones. I put up the poll. There was, I think, 400 votes, something like that. And the majority of them were in favour of Barry Jones versus Jimmy Sweeney. Even Sweeney's fans want to see Barry Jones versus Jimmy Sweeney. Please, Jim, Joe, whoever. I'm looking into the camera now. I'm begging you. Barry Jones versus Jimmy Sweeney next. Doesn't matter when it is. I couldn't care less. It just needs to happen at some stage. I know they both won't be remember, uh, both be available for November. I think January maybe, or I think the next card might be March or February. Can't remember. But regardless, in 2022, Jimmy Sweeney must fight Barry Jones. It is the perfect fight. The styles match up beautifully. It is everything you want from a bare knuckle fight. And I'm sorry to go on for it for so long, but it needs to happen. Paolo, are you in agreement with me here? 100%. And you know what? If Sweeney's unavailable, you can jump in, can't you? Definitely not. Um, that is not happening. I will never fight bare knuckle for many reasons, <laughs> including Barry Jones being a potential opponent. Um, if I was about to say if Barry Jones could get down to 69 kilograms, but he legit, legitimately could. So actually, I'm not even going to say anything. Barry, I'll take the fight with you. If you tie both of your hands behind your back and you allow me a three round head start over five. <laughs> But apart from that, I refuse. And also, I get 90% of the pay-per-view revenue and the bigger purse. On that note, yes, I also do want that fight. Sweeney and Barry Jones needs to happen for the fans, for the legacy. And for me. And for me, because I really don't want to fight Barry Jones. (laughs) (laughs) So, Jim and Joe, please... From one poor child with, with a, you know, a very scary prospect on his hands, make Barry Jones versus Jimmy Sweeney. <laughs>